So if a, if a patient does come to you and be like, I want to do shadow work, I want to work with my shadow, like, what do you do with that? It's the moment in Dante's story, right? When he meets the guy and they're about to enter. Mm. I think many people, myself included, it took me a few years in analysis to understand what shadow actually is. There is a difference between shadow encounter and shadow work. So usually what people, when people start therapy, they have a lot of shadow encounter. So they start discovering all these things about themselves. Realization about how their family life wasn't as idealistic or something like that. So that's the encounter. That's just the recognition. Shadow work is that you're actually feeling the thing and you encounter the archetype, right? So if you're working with your trauma, you're starting to feel that repressed anger, that repressed pain, that repressed grief. It's actually like a bottom up process. You have to go into it and have it consume you for a little bit. And that's the shadow work. Yeah. Right? And that's just the beginning. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. Despite my interest in psychology, particularly the mythopoetic Jungian flavor, I am but an enthusiast. I am simply exploring it philosophically uh, and personally. That is, I don't wield it professionally on the psyche of other humans. I stick to wielding it irresponsibly in a self-facing direction. But my wonder brother, Dr. Ido Cohen, does. The former, not the latter. Dr. Ido Cohen is a psychologist who is centrally interested in the very same questions and curiosities that underpin the psyche, the soul, and the human condition at large that I am and I'm sure you are. He too is deeply interested in Jung and related thinkers, so I greatly treasure these regular mind melds that we get to have. In this one in particular though, we spend a lot of time musing about a topic that I know many of you are interested in, the shadow, in terms of what is it? How do you really work with it? How do you really encounter it? What function does it serve in the psyche? And on that note, we muse about a personal tragedy that Ido is currently coping with, currently making sense of, that is his home burnt down. He lost 95% of all of his possessions. So he's been doing a lot of real-time shadow work, actually going through somewhat of a dark night of the soul. We also explore the role of archetypes in the psyche, why the trickster archetype in particular is so important and so prevalent, and so many other wonder dips throughout, of course. All the links you will need for Dr. Ido Cohen are in the description, as are all of the necessary keyboard mudras and portals for third eye drops. On that note, do tickle the algorithm with a like and a sub. It is of the utmost importance for the health and growth of this media vessel. By the way, did you know we have over 300 audio-only podcasts that you will never hear or see or be able to consume here on YouTube? So do subscribe to Third Eye Drops wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Pods, wherever that may be. And if you would like to go a layer deeper, support these transmissions more directly, and join a community, go over to Patreon dot com forward slash third eye drops there you can not only crowd sponsor the show but join in on calls zoom hangs with myself and guests you've heard on the show like dr ito cohen who has joined us for a couple of calls in fact we've also got a book club patron only discord you can get rewards like stickers pins shirts and more and with that my fellow sentient sacks of stardust let's meld minds with dr ito cohen my brother pleasure to meld minds with you as it always is and it's an especially novel time i think for for so many reasons i like in in your own life because you had a recent crazy kind of memento mori reset thing happen to you um i just came back from this really mind-blowing head-spinning conference but there's so much other stuff going on in the zeitgeist mm -hmm. that i feel like we could attack all of this from but I think, especially based on our pre-talk conversation, that one of the archetypes that's probably going to run through this whole conversation is the shadow and how the shadow 
metamorphosizes and is constantly masquerading as something else that and, and convinces individual people to project it out onto the world <laughs> rather than deal with their own shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I know that's very vague, but I think it will become, I think it will become more clear. I think so too. Always a pleasure to be here. Very excited to talk to you, Michael. Me too, man. So this mm -hmm. is obviously a topic that people are perennially very interested in, very curious about, and I think often confused by, and myself included, because it makes sense that the shadow is going to be this nebulous, dark thing. It, it, it inherently lives in the unconscious part of the mind. So I guess starting from, you know, the small individual sort of point of view, since that's kind of what you're an expert in as a psychologist, I would imagine that people come to you pretty directly, like, I want to work with my shadow or, or I want to do it shadow is. work. And even I, unfortunately, am in the position now where people come to me with this question. I'm like, first of all, I'm just a hobbyist. I'm, I'm like philosophically interested in these things and personally interested in these things. But I can only tell you what experts say. And, and it does, even then, you know, you get into specific examples from Jung and specific techniques. And even then, it's still very nebulous and hard to approach. So, so if, a, if a patient does come to you and they're like, I want to do shadow work, I want to work with my shadow, like, what do you do with that? How do you begin that process? First, I, I, I say good luck. You know, I wish <laughs> yeah. you good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. It's, it's that, uh, it's the moment in Dante's story, right? When he meets the guy and they're about to enter. Mm. Yeah. Right. But so when someone comes and tells me that, I'm like, okay, so you, you're, you're on the precipice and you're asking to see how you can first just enter the space, enter into that, right? Those layers that have to go. What is it? Seven worlds, right? In Dante, is it for him? Oh yeah. However many circles of hell, seven exactly. or nine or whatever. Right. Yeah. And then only then you go into the middle and then purgatory and then right there's the heaven. Um, I think many people, myself included, it took me a few years in analysis to understand what shadow actually, like not just intellectually, but like on an embodied level, understand what doing shadow work. Yeah. In today, I always make this discernment for people that there is a difference between shadow encounter and shadow work. Mm. Right? Knowing mm. that you, so usually what people, when people start therapy, they have a lot of shadow encounter. So they start discovering all these things about themselves, right? Maybe realization about how their family life wasn't as idealistic or something like that. Or they start realizing like, oh, I, I am petty sometimes and I have anger outbursts and I'm also jealous. And, oh, wow, I do dissociate pretty often, right? So that's the encounter. That's just the recognition. Jung even called it, it was the first phase of therapy is uh, confession. You're mm. just confessing. Hmm. He said there are four stages that only then therapy can start. So the first thing is you're just doing confessions. You start having very honest confessions. Um, shadow work is that you're actually feeling the thing, be sensing it in your body. It starts to really, and you encounter the archetype, right? So if you're working with your trauma, you're starting to feel that repressed anger, that repressed pain, that repressed grief. It lingers with you. You have to feel it through your... It's actually like a bottom-up process. You have to go into it and have it consume you for a little bit before you start doing the understanding, analysis, compassion. Um, that's the shadow work. Yeah. Right? And that's just the beginning. That's the internal process. Right, right. Then there is the, the integration piece and then there is the implementation piece, which is you have, you do all that inner alchemy and then it's like, wow, well, I have to go tell my, my partner that I'm depressed or I have to actually understand that there is an incredible creative inside of me and I want to go start being a writer or make a video or, you know, more my personal 
research and passion right now is people who are trying to integrate the unimaginable, right? Yeah, so all of yeah, a sudden yeah. they're understanding that they are maybe, I actually just now we're working with someone um, who is writing an article for my project, The Integration Circle, about going through gender change and then having a very profound process and actually now in the process of going back. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Man, what a, what an, think initi- about that. What an initiation that is. Right. What an initiation that is. And, and I, something that I feel very reluctant to comment on or talk about as a cis white dude. Um, but I, I think, you know, you're, you're hitting on something really interesting because I think people's interest in the shadow is also a mirror image of people's innate crying out for the mystery and the numinous because the shadow is essentially the dark reflection of that impulse right it's like you you're like you you're spiritually like yearning for something for purpose for meaning for something beyond the normal Absolutely. and you may construe that as wanting desiring to connect with that realm but in a way that can also like i really think the ent- the true entryway to that is through the shadow and i think that's why people like like jung and hillman emphasize the almost like chthonic element of maturation that like the mm-hmm. the growing like you you know he called um hillman called it growing down Mm-hmm. Rather than, you know, we have this idea that we're like reaching up or we're ascending or we're awakening and we're going to 5D or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And really, it's like, have you tried just growing roots into the soil of the Boy, human the experience of yourself into the underworld? Because mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. where, you know, if if you have it, you know, it's the other. I mean, it's it's so cliche. I almost don't want to say it, but it's cliche because it's profound. You know, Jung's. Jung's quote about like no tree can reach to heaven unless it's its roots reach to hell, you know, and and it's like nobody wants the roots to reach to hell. Everybody just wants the wants like the perfect straight rise up to heaven, you know, and <laughs> in personal experiences and in so many other stories about people that I know and I'm sure you know, the most inspiring ones are the people who have been through hell. I think this is why. Mm-hmm. There are so many best-selling books about people who like recovered from addiction or like had a near-death experience or a traumatic experience because it's that initiation and being forcibly dunked into the underworld that like really contextualizes the value of your individual life, the brevity of your life. And in a way, it's like you almost require that kind of ordeal initiation to really understand what the opposite means. Because if you're just operating from the status quo, from the everyday, from the beige doldrums of just, I'm a little bit bored. I really want some meaning in life, like, <laughs> which I honestly mostly am that person. But it's always those situations that remind me how short life is, remind me how fragile life is, that I appreciate it for what it is properly, you know? And, and, and in a way, it's like the cessation, and this sounds very Buddhist, I guess, but in a lot of ways, it's the cessation of wanting to reach for that higher thing that actually makes you spiritually mature because it, it it makes you appreciate the present moment. It makes you appreciate your life, your soul, all the people in your life. Um, and those are measure, those are like measurable spiritual elements to your life. If you feel connected to the earth, connected to your family, connected to your friends, community, all of those things. Um, but I, so, Ramp my ramble aside for you. No, I, no, can I, I respond to your? Of ramble? course, of course, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I took a uh, workshop this weekend with Arnold Elshade, who is a. I always reference him as a brilliant psychoanalyst, Jungian analyst. He has a PhD in divinity on top of all of it. What's and his name? He gave this Donald Kelshed. So okay. Trauma in the Soul is his second book. But by far, I think the the most influential writer and and practitioner about the connection between the human experience and true spirituality, I I would call it. Beautiful. I can, I cannot recommend. 
but he gave this quote that I think actually, as you were talking about, oh, Michael, you're, so this is from the workshop, right? So this is Ewing from Mysterium Conictionis. He talks about, if you will contemplate your lack of fantasy, inspiration, and inner alignment, which you feel as a sheer stagnation and barren wilderness, and impregnate it with interests born of alarm, then something can take shape in you. Hmm. For your inner emptiness conceals just as just the great and fullness if you allow it, if you allow your longing for fulfillment to quicken the sterile wilderness of your soul as rain quickens the dry earth. I love Jung, but his writing sometimes is so hard to like fully, fully grok. I guess the way I interpret it yeah. is, is right. It's. I think you sp- you just spoke exactly to it. It's this idea. Right? I think a lot of people don't respond well to that image of hell and heaven because all those inspiring people you talk about for me, they didn't go to hell. They were just embodied. They were in the realness of the human experience. Yeah. But because we're all, most of us are, you know, have religious trauma. And the moment we hear hell or heaven, there is or to make like a a response to it. But I agree with you. It's, you know how hard it is to be human, to be truly human, <laughs> to be like full human is really, really hard. If it wasn't that hard, we didn't, we wouldn't need all these theories and philosophies. We will all just hang out in an in individuation process all the time. Um, so I think when you say all that, I'm thinking, yeah, the shadow. But this is where shadow gets interesting because shadow is not just negative. Shadow is also, again, integrating right. the unimaginable. Yeah, there are right. There is one of Jung's his favorite golden shadow quotes for me is the unconscious is ninety percent. Oh wow! Now he meant it as right the potential for a chemical goal. So inside your unconscious, there is all the, right. This is what he's talking about the the dry land of your soul, which is waiting for rain to grow, to awaken, to mm. grow things. Yeah, right, yeah, so yeah, shadow yeah. is everything out of light of consciousness. Right, so when your house burns down, burns down, mm-hmm. you can take yeah. it many places. Right, if you if you're open enough, you can start seeing the plethora of shadow that's being exposed. Yeah, if you decide to quit your job and start doing what you truly want, that's a goal. Right, this is something that was somewhere in there, growing slowly, growing. So when people talk about shadow, you know, I now I'm in a place in my development. I'm like, yeah, shadow is actually a very non-dual concept. Hmm. We just we just took on the right as we humans do. We took on the oh, shadow is this or way. It's all your pains and your traumas and the collective trauma and the collective pain, and we forgot that's like through that exploration that you get to get in touch with the parts of your child archetype that also had to go into hiding the curiosity, the play, the creativity, sexuality. And then there's another layer of it, which is something that you didn't even imagine. All right. So when we say, you know, when you look at all these people who are so inspiring and, you know, the business them who became a writer, that's just the the level of surface. Right, right. Go we'll talk to that person and see how they changed from in- right, 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 right. How they became so. I read an interview with um, the founder of GoDaddy, mm-hmm. and he was in a he gave a talk in a conference in Arizona, um, talking about his experience with psychedelics, and he said, "You know, he's a war veteran," and he said, "I finally arrived," but he didn't mean that he got over his trauma. What he noticed is, I loved my kids more. Uh, I was yeah. more present with them. I was more kind with them. And that transforms everything. So the surface level, I changed my job, I changed a partner. That's just the really the surface expression of the deep, deep, deep work inside the garden of soul that happens, right? Right. So that's also right. shadow. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a and great how point. how do we hold all of it? Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes it so much less nebulous when you realize that any daily mundane thing, any effort, anything can be the veneer of shadow work in that you it, it could be anything that you're doing. If it's making you 
plunge into the unknown, if it's making you explore elements of your mind, fight through barriers, overcome plateaus, because I, I like this notion that 90% of the unconscious is gold, but I only like it if it's preempted with, but you know what it takes to get gold? It takes chiseling and blasting and mining and so that piece comes before yeah. the next piece which is one does not find i don't remember exactly right but that one does not find truth by imagining figures of light but yeah one, so the 90 percent gold comes before that piece of per okay perfect, perfect but it's always omitted right so he said then you don't get there by imagining figures of light and you know the whole Sometimes necessary spiritual bypass. He's like, no, it's getting by going into the realms of the shadow. Yeah. But when you understand what shadow is, you understand that it's all of it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Jung's through going through his crazy, quote unquote, shamanic transformation, wrote the, the red book that you have behind right. you, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. the bedrock for his entire philosophy that then changed psychology. And so right. many people's life. He actually has a really, I, for people who are interested, I don't know if you read it. There is, he wrote a, a short uh, essay on uh, the nature of evil. I don't think and I read it, said, no. Highly recommend. I can send it. Cool, cool. And he said, you can only know if something is evil in the after. Uh. He says, rarely do you know that something is evil in the moment, right? And what does that mean? How many times that something happened to you? That then a week, a month, a year later, we were like, you know what? That was actually really good for me. Right. And that time it was horrible. Now I can start seeing how that's basically the best thing that ever happened to me. And you hear that from people who are were terminally ill. Yeah. Right? People who have lost their partner after 45 years, who and they're like, but they are able to work with the shadow, right? They're able to really embody it. And move from an intellectual. A lot of people do shadow work as an intellectual inquiry. And we can start leaking into archetypes in the same way, right? Yeah, yeah. We talked about, uh, off, we were texting about, right, all the things that's, um, your red book primed me, actually. Uh, what's happening with orcas now, right? How these oh, orcas yeah. are hiking. Yeah, right. Right? And orcas and whales and dolphins who are not supposed to bond together because orcas teeth are bonding together because something is happening. Jung has one of his beautiful images in the Red Book is the images inside what looks like a Viking ship in this horrendous creature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? That's, the, that's the unconscious. That's the yeah. shadow, both negative and positive. Yeah. How do you move away from it being an intellectual concept, right? Seeing, embodying an archetype which I, I think you talk a lot about. How do you really, you, your trickster video, and you mean your shadow, right? How do you embody an archetype? Really, not just yeah. start like, you know, oh man, it's great, you know, I pull a card of Zeus and now I have like Zeus energy and it's like, great. No, it's like you want to feel, I, I, you know, I live in California. Everybody gets really riled up when they see a fox or a coyote. Every time they see a fox or a coyote, I take a breath because I know what trickster archetype I, I've felt the both end, and I'm like, Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah, what is this a harbinger of, yeah. Exactly, I'm like, I, I, it just reminds me of like, you don't know, you don't yeah. know what's gonna happen. Yeah, everybody you know, thinks the trickster is is conspiring for them, and, and, you know, meanwhile, it could absolutely be, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, I'm just, I'm totally projecting this onto you, and, and this may not be true. Please. But you, you, you may have been, tossing and turning at night thinking i really need a change god please give me a change you know just please give me a change and the trickster might come along and say oh i'll give you a change and burn your house down and burn and, my that's, house and, and that's what absolutely. happened to you yeah absolutely i i it's actually quite uh quite what you said is really kind of picturing what i would what i was going through i was praying for change i saw i saw things and i was doing things but deep deep inside Something resonant is like, oh, you you want you are you really ready? You you want change, and boom, my 
full life burned out. 95% of my possessions. My whole, and what, what the, it's hard to explain to people, but it's not, it's not the, it's when you lose the thing that gives you the most stability. That's what it was. Literally having no home. Now, obviously yeah. I, I'm, I'm very privileged, right? I have friends. That have, uh, yeah, that was a strike. And I remember when the first initial shock kind of recited, I was like, I actually smiled. And I was like, okay, what is this about? Mm-hmm. Why? Because I could imagine a lot of things happening to me. Having fire of this magnitude constellate in my life was never on my imagination table. Yeah. Like, okay, well, I have, right? I ought, you know, fire. This is an intense purification. And everybody kept saying, oh, you're in the Phoenix stage. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is not. That's, that archetype feels very uh, vanilla towards what's happening mm. for me. This is just mm. fire. Mm. This is just standing in the fire that's going to burn. Yeah. All the, the, for me, it was mostly about fantasy. Interesting. So you're bringing up an interesting point here because there's there's this... Anytime anything orthogonal happens in life, unexpected, completely out of the blue happens, there is an opportunity for spiritual bypassing in terms of this happened to me, so this could happen. And on one hand, we're taking that notion seriously. But on the other hand, you're rejecting the easy out of saying like, yeah, this is my Phoenix rising from the ashes moment, you know? So how do you personally delineate between the spiritual bypassing while at the same time taking the unknown seriously, taking the unconscious seriously, taking the unexplainable seriously? Because that, that to me is just like the the mercurial balancing point of all balancing points, right? Because obviously, you know, for anybody listening, you know, I'm very open-minded to synchronicity. You know, I'm very open-minded to the Mysterium Tremendum, but I am so reluctant to ever say, I know why anything is happening. Like if people are asking me, why is the synchronicity happening? You know, I, I could construct an entire story. I could look into the symbolism. I could be, oh, it's like a waking dream. So you have to analyze it like a dream. I could do all of those things. But I don't know. It could easily just be me looking for meaning. And really what's happening is what Jung called the unis unis mundus is just bleeding in, like the the unexplainable interconnection between mind and physicality is peeking Mm -hmm. into reality. And maybe it doesn't mean anything other than that. Maybe it's just like a little leak in in, in whatever the fabric is. Maybe that's all it is. Or maybe there is meaning, you know? And, and, And to me, I'm always just like, I... It, you know, you know, you know what I think it stems from my my reluctance to say what anything is. Think about what the gods always do in every story to anybody who overreaches. Bam, you know, just hubris. Like as soon as you have hubris and you think you know or that you you think you're you're always punished, you know. Prometheus we were talking is, about this yeah, yesterday, yeah. right? In, in mm-hmm. we were talking about this yesterday. If you go into any direction, if you go into, well, I don't know anything, you're gonna become Job, right? This kind of blind faith of I don't know. It's all just a mystery. Oh, okay. You really want to live your life like that? Then we will take you on the ride. You, we want to take. You. Hmm. If you go into the other route, right? Then trickster comes and is like, oh, you you fossilized yourself. You think you know everything. Let's show you how. I always tell this. In one of my courses, we had a man, wonderful man, painfully cerebral, like painfully. And we one of the exercises we do is that I assign people archetypes. I have this process that I... I like to think that I'm kind of uh, synchronicity assigning people archetypes because I think about them and then I open my my book and I, and he got water. Hmm. 
So we met, and then they had two weeks to have like this very particular um, structure of how they work with the archetype. So they start by just pre-associating one day, and then you do that. And then you go and you, you can look up stuff about the archetype, you amplify. And then for the next day, all you have to do is you have to go. Go be in water, go touch water, go sit next to water. Don't think it. The man had diarrhea from oh, the first day. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Until the next meeting. And he, he got it. And he got it. He's like, I understand why this happened to me. Only after a week on the toilet. Because wow. what he got was that he was forced to be in his stomach. Hmm. To sit in the body. To be in discomfort. That's the best way to get someone out of there. When you have, you have diarrhea for two weeks, you can't guess what it is. Okay, you start with, okay, I ate something bad. Okay, that three days doesn't pass. Okay, so it's not that. I have a stomach bug. I try into antibiotics. Well, it's not that. That's not helping. And then all of a sudden you start working with it, diarrhea stuff. So when you ask me, really, for me, the, having that fire was, it was like being taken to a curriculum on that, exactly, because I didn't know why. And I also felt that I was in a place that I didn't want to project. I was like, I'm going to let the experience tell me why. Yeah. And I just followed. I really, I was in a very, very, the first two weeks I was, I felt like I was in another space, a very deep introverted space of observation. And there was this, entity with me. I don't know who that was, but there was someone who was pointing things out to me. And it was showing me fears and how those fears birthed all these structures that I put in my life. And it showed me the beauty of having those fears being burnt. You know, from the I always give this example. I had no clothes. I had the clothes I was wearing that night. That's it. Wow. And then I went to buy clothes. And I was like, oh, I had this moment of realizing, oh, I get to choose clothes based on who I am right now. Most people, when they open their closet, they're choosing clothes they've committed to anywhere between three and seven years ago. Yeah. If I took your closet away and gave you money, most odds you'd buy something different. So that was just a metaphor, right? And I was just sorry to play with that metaphor. Like, oh, what is it? Now I get to choose everything from this. You know, the first three days I felt incredibly naked. And I was like, you know what? If I'm already naked, I'll make, okay, that, that means I have to be really vulnerable. How do I go out into the world and tell people like, this is what happened to me? And put myself in vulnerable place. So I let the experience tell me what it is. And then I followed. And it became this like loop. And I don't, I, I'm not saying it was easy at all. I don't want this to sound like I was, you know, floating in archetypal consciousness and just in harmony with the whole thing. No, it was hard. Yeah. But I really was in a space, I'm very grateful, where it felt like all the, the, the tools that I've had and the people around me helped me stay in this frequency where I, I let the experience tell me what it is. I integrated it. I did what I did. And then I started play, acting on it. And then it yeah. told me again. And that's really hard to suspend because most of us have, I'm curious what you think, right? So the question is, why is it so scary to be in the end though? Oh, I think that's, I think that's easy because in the, you know, we romanticize change when we're yeah. stable, but when we're confronted with actual change, we realize sort of in the same way that I was talking about before that you only get to the other side of change to a new imagined preferable stability by going through the darkness in whatever way that that presents itself to you. Like if it's a fire, a breakup, a new job, a move, like whatever it is, the, the process of getting from previous point of comfort and stability to new point of comfort and stability is always a dark, treacherous journey. It has to be because you don't know what's around the next corner. 
Like you, it's it. You know, any of but those. Does it have things, to be dark? Why I think I no. I I'm gonna stick to. I think it does have to be dark because. But why? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's multiple dimensions of why because there, there's a psychological dimension of just uncertainty, being uncomfortable, of not knowing. You know, well, you know, just putting myself. I'm gonna pretend. Knock on wood. Pretend my house burned down. Am I going to get insurance money? Am I going to find a place to live? A am I am I going to be able to save any of the things that were important to me? Am I going to you know, um, you know, there's just, there's just a, an endless list of of things of psychological turmoil, of financial turmoil, of you know, who, who knows? You know, there, there's just so many things you can't predict, and I think when you can't predict things, the mind begins to torment itself. Because mm -hmm. when the the mind wants certainty, the mind wants stability. Now, I think you can be more comfortable than some in uncertainty, but I think uncertainty is inherently, you know, it, it heightens the senses, it, it heightens it, it heightens sensitivities because you have to be like, you know, even just think about like the archetypal liminal experience of traveling. It's it like, is. where's my turn? Is this car going to merge into me? Is this my flight? Yeah, right. Did I? Oh, my 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 flight changed gates. You know, there's always like that. There's there's this increased sense of aliveness in any liminal space of moving from point Absolutely. A to point B. And this is why the trickster. Th this is the archetypal space of the trickster because the trickster could fuck you up on that liminal or whatever. You don't even have to call it the trickster, but anything could fuck you up in that in that vulnerable process of moving from point A to point B. Because you're not yeah. stable, you're you're you have whatever's on your back, or you're in your car, or you're on your flight, and you're letting go of some level of control by being in an env a stochastic environment that's out of your control. But that's also the portal to everything that matters. You know, it's also the portal mm -hmm. to any kind of transformation that matters. And yeah, it it reminds me. There's this chapter of the book in Midlife by Murray Stein, the famous Jungian analyst that I read when I was making the Hermes video because the whole first chapter is about the Hermes archetype and, you know, the trickster archetype and how it presents itself. And um, in some ways it sounds very scary, but at the same time, this entity, this archetype is also known as the most friendly God to man. And yeah. that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. Like why, why, why is this entity both, scary and dark and uncertain and might want to fuck with you and might want to give you <laughs> you know a treasure where you thought something bad was going to happen or vice versa um so that might be an interesting side thing but i think you had a reason for asking me that question in the first place so i don't want to bypass no that. i really no 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 this is great i really appreciate what you're saying and I, I agree you know you talks about the psyche being paradoxically oriented towards homeostasis and change at the same time. It's this thing with the two. There's always a two that you have to like work with, right? Um, and I, as you were talking, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I, I, it sounds very gruff what you're saying, right? You have to hmm. go through the birth canal and it has to yeah. be uncomfortable. There has to be that crushing sensation of, are we going to make it? Am I going to get to that fight? Are we going to find the house? Oh my God, moving, right? It's funny to me that moving is the third most stressful life experience you can have. Oh yeah, Birth, I believe death it. Death and moving. <laughs> yeah, right? I believe it. On the hierarchy of- All transitions. Stress. All transitions, exactly. yeah. All yeah. of them are that canal, right? All of them are that canal. All of them are going through the parting of the sea. Um, I call it, you know, I, I use it with people that I work with who are- coming from um, spiritual retreats or whatever, you know, entheogenic experience. I'm like, yeah, you're, you're either exiting the stratosphere or you're entering the stratosphere. And it's, you think about movies, every time you enter exits, right, it's that heat and combustion yeah, and everything is yeah, shaking and you, yeah. everybody's not sure, are we going to make it? Are we not going to make it? And then right, you're either exiting into this beautiful bliss or you're landing back on Earth. Yeah. Everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, I just think there is also that, you know, as far as shadow work goes, we want to wonder what are we, you know, you and I talked about Mary Lewis Monfoss and projections, right? But what do we, the un, the unknown is also a great canvas for projection. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So it's actually, if you want to do shadow work, look at yourself in transitional spaces and see what you're painting on that canvas. Mm-hmm. Right? What kind of horrors are you into? What yeah. kind of stories are running through that software? That, oh my God, I, uh, I think, for, you know, I, I, relationships are the best. What goes on in your head before you go on a first date? Before you're about to say something, right? Really new, exciting, or challenging to your partner or your coworker or a friend. It's that same kind of, it's like a micro example of, so of that birth canal, right? Oh my God, yeah. will Michael accept it? Will he be upset with me? Will he be able to hold me? Will he be, where's all that coming from? I'll hold if you, it's man. unknown, I should I'll be able you. to take a deep breath. <laughs> I am sure. I have zero <laughs> doubt. It. Uh, right, so just the idea of what comes in that projection. What is coming out of us? And I do think it's important because you said it so beautifully. That's the gates we have to go through to create on the most profound level, right? From creating breakfast to creating your life's vision, to creating the next company that's going to change the world, to anything in the middle. We all have to go through that. And how do we, what shadow work is needed for us to find the right allies and tools to go through that stratosphere successfully? Yeah. You know, that where Jung talks about how the poor, well, that's where they fall apart mm. in the exiting of the stratosphere or the entering. Hmm. Yeah, we should we should maybe revisit the puer puella archetype for people who aren't familiar with it. It it's essentially this notion of well well it popularly at least manifests as people who are stuck in a sort of childish phase. So the the puer is like a, famously um, known as kind of like the Peter Pan kind of personality who won't grow up, who who you know pushes responsibility away, pushes change away too, right? Um, but yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? Because if if you put the puer, if you, like w- my favorite example is like, you know, an obvious example of like if you grow up and your parents are doing everything for you and then suddenly they cut you off, right? That's a great way to, to, to force evolution out of the puer. But are they going to be happy with you? No. Is it going to be comfortable for them? No. Is it going to be easy yep. for them? No. But in a way, it's like they've they've sort of brought it upon themselves, right? By by consistently being irresponsible, by consistently relying on the parents, by you know whatever. And it makes sense. It's like, yeah, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna do what we do to baby birds when it's time for them to fly. We're gonna push you off the branch, and you're gonna have to figure it yeah, out. You? And you're good. yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Right, Mary Louise from France talks about how one way to work so for the men or men identified in in the audience you can read Puer Eternus by Mary Louise from France and for women there is a book called Motherhood by Lisa Marciano that talks about the Puella a Mm. really really beautiful way Um, right but Mary Louise from France talks about actually how disappointment is a necessary gateway for the Puer yeah you have to tolerate this you actually need to be this multiple times in your life to grow out of that possession to be the one that right to be to fail to try and put something in the world and get three likes and be like oh my god this is horrible (laughs) yeah i thought it was the creation of god and i'll be nobody's responding to it right yeah and how do you build a healthy response to that right right which she then talks about like that that's the actual Psycho spiritual birth. That makes right. sense. How we your yeah. birth, right? You said it. You we have to struggle. It's that's how we are born. And I think a lot of people who do shadow work want to avoid that. They want to be born into the what Calshit talks about it, into the light angel. Into like, oh, I'm just gonna I'm like one hashtag away from being famous, or like one, you know, five posts right. from doing this, or like one workshop from finding my soul partner, and then it's all gonna be so easy. Which is such, I always, actually, when I say this, even right now, it makes me feel, it opens my heart because I'm like, oh, I can feel the, the agony behind it. The desire to come up, to come to this garden where everything is just good. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're all struggling to any, anybody who's in a, you know, a phase of building their own thing, working toward anything, trying to get promoted, trying to build a following, trying to do something. We're all just tilling that field in hopes the plants spring up. You know, we're all, we're all hoping that we, or, or to use the shadow metaphor, we're all hoping we're digging in the right place for that gold. And it sounds kind of shallow to equate outer success with inner success. But I think it, it depends because they're not mutually exclusive. Like you can certainly be successful on the outside and not be doing shadow work. That's for sure. I mean, I think that's Absolutely. sort of the archetype of of a lot, of, like a hallmark of a lot of Jung's point is that you're going to spend the first 40, 50 years of your life trying to be conventionally successful. And then once you become conventionally successful, you'll be like, holy shit, this is not it. Or maybe it's not, maybe it's not that it's not it, but it's that now you're not satisfied by that anymore. And you need to find that inner satisfaction and for some people mm -hmm. it comes sooner for some people it comes later for some people it might never come mm -hmm. but i think there i think there can be a connection but there's like some kind of weird earnest turn inward where what you're doing on the outside is more of a manifestation of what's going on on the inside you know what i mean like you 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 know that's when people do the career change or mm -hmm. you know why so many people become a psychoanalyst when they're like 40 plus years old from my understanding it's like really common as a, mm -hmm. as a career later in life um or they quit their job and become spiritual and start traveling or mm -hmm. start something that they're more passionate about there, there's some kind of turn where the inner and outer start to hopefully mirror one another that the outer process becomes more of a manifestation of the inner process if that makes exactly. sense yes um yeah that's that's part of what i went through when i was talking about the clothes it wasn't just literal clothes it was metaphorical clothes ah uh, yeah okay makes all sense. of us wake up in the morning we put on personality one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. tell, tell out, the personality yeah. one right so the it's the what we again it's right so personality one is the persona mm -hmm. the bridge between self and the world not the capital s self small s right it's the part of us that needs to create connections with people it's the part of us that needs to go to work it's the part of the, that wants to function in society absolutely necessary when does it become a problem when we think that that's all we are right so that's the very that's the archetype that you're talking about the way I understand it, that's the very successful person outwardly that has a miserable family life and is depressed and anxious and unempathic and perpetuates collective systems of oppression, but is a multi-billionaire and right, or a successful whatever. I don't know what it is, but it, right. There is a disconnect from personality too, right? Which is your soul your inner world for right. those who are sensitive to the world. So, right. The part of you that sits in reflection and contemplation that is imaginary, that's actually also emotional, that is able to experience and receive vulnerability and eros and intimacy and imagination and intuition and all the things that are not of the outer world. Right. Right. Cal Shedd talks about this beautiful mask it's an inuit mask that's called the storyteller mm -hmm. and it has one eye open and one eye closed cool. and the idea cool. is that one eye is always right one of the open eyes personality one it's always looking out it's in interaction with it's learning from it's responding to the closed one is personality too you're always looking in and then that's the integrated approach right you're right of the world but not in the world of the world, but you don't just occupy the outer world. You're also in your inner world, right? So that I think for me, that's where there is a lot of how do we get to this disconnect of how do you invest in that inner world? Yes, you know, it makes 100%. me think. I I have a question for you. Uh, I told you I was watching The Northman, and I just finished it. And he's there's there's one of the archetypal arcs. There is you see this boy who gets handed this fate, right? So we were talking about following the, the unknown. There is also mm -hmm. a question of, I know you, we talked 
or you knew talked about the daemon, right? That's Helmut's thing. In the movie, it's the the Nords of Fate, right? Those are the three <clears throat> goddesses who tell everyone who is what they're. Yeah, yeah. And you can't escape your. Yeah. And I think that's where people get really true. That there is this internal pressure; it's relentless. And then all of a sudden, in 50, right, it used to be midlife crisis. I mean, I think our generation is a little screwed because I think the the new 50 is 40. I just see that across the board. Midlife crisis now comes at 40. Because we're much more open, right? Yeah. But what do you think about, okay, we have to introduce also this idea of there is something inside of you that is going to relentlessly want to express itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it is figuring out what for you feels like a spiritually cathartic action mm. and way of being in the world. And this comes directly from Jung because in um, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, he's got this quote about how every single person who came to him over the age of like 30 who was depressed, he said, I think the quote exactly is, there was not a single one of them in the last resort who didn't find relief through adding a spiritual dimension to their life or, so, or something to that effect. And the problem is, what does that mean? And, and how do you find a real spiritual outlook that's honest, that takes account of everything we're talking about, right? Like the light and the dark. Not just some 5D crystal consciousness light body bullshit that's like all spiritual bypassing and only good things happen to me and I manifest my own reality. So, and then suddenly your house does burn down and you have to go through immense contortions to try to like make sense of, of that. Though I think you could still make sense of it, but it's, you know, it's, it's this dance, right? It's like what, what feels authentic? What, what really accounts for everything? And I think that that answer is is individually tailored, but I also think I think it's I think it's two things. I think you have to have certain principles and certain activities in your life, like community, ways to talk about it, spaces to go to where you feel spiritually connected, but then also some kind of dynamic living practice where you feel like you're on the frontier of doing something that's at least personally important to you and is hopefully important mm -hmm. to other people too. And if you can somehow balance all of those things, the community, the activity, the the philosophical and spiritual catharsis, I think I think you have the building blocks of that thing that Jung was talking about. While at the same time it do it doesn't have to be specific or denominational. It can be if that works for you. But like we were talking about yesterday, like Jung's thoughts on God, pretty non-denominational, pretty not traditional in like a Western monotheistic sense, way more mystical, way more Neoplatonic and Gnostic and potentially Kabbalic. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's the sort of trifecta. And, and I mm -hmm. think all, ultimately then you're starting to take ownership over both the closed eye and the open eye that you were talking about mm -hmm. in the previous example, because they're, they're working together toward the same goal rather than feeling bifurcated and split down the middle. Like most people do. This is my personality one that I use to go through life and, and it conceals my inner world. My inner world stays cloistered and hidden rather than I'm trying to transmute them all into one thing into a third eye. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, you know, like, tr it but is, it is kind of, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But you know, it's like, it's like you're, you're developing that stereoscopic vision that having two eyes mm -hmm. is supposed to give you. Yeah. Right. Um, and, 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 and that's a very mythopoetic Michael Phillip response, but I think that's like the best response I can give. I love what do you, it. What do you think? I think it, I'm with you. I think, you know, I, I, I'm always in the, I feel like part of my job is to be a, a, always to be a translator. Right. Yeah. So I think it, I'm like, even hearing you say, I'm like, yes. And how do we say all that without the word spiritual? Because even that triggers people's right stuff. Yeah. You can just right? say psychological. <laughs> say, but even that triggers people, right? It's how do you say that? Mental. Right. This I don't idea know. of 
journeying that, I love how you said it, right? Find the thing, find the thing, find the thing inside that feels right and true and follow it, right? Yeah. And then like we, what we said before, follow it for a bit and let it then tell you what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> right. I, so try to become that writer for a year and let it tell you what it's like to be a writer. But don't wait for the result. Be in the process, right? So find that, right? So follow that thing. Try it out, right? This is where it becomes very, I think it's also a premise, but I don't know, right? This is where it's all of a sudden it becomes a lot more playful for me. And that's what I actually think Jung was incredibly playful. Oh, yeah. I mean, walking around in your garden for three hours talking to imaginary beings is incredibly playful, if you think about it. Who, do, who else does it other than people with dementia? Children. Yeah. Yep. Right? Because they're so connected. They don't have all those structures that separate them from the creative source, right? From what he would call the self or the collective unconscious. They just play. Yeah. Right? So this is where it becomes a lot more loose and, and kind of a little kaleidoscopic colored, very happy, very kind of psychedelic science uh, lounge area where all these, <laughs> yeah. the art is and, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and all the performances are, right? All of a deep sudden deep space, a little... they called it. Deep space, deep space. which is there like the go. perfect name too. Um, I, I like what you're saying and I kind of want to talk about the story of how he would walk around and talk to Philemon, but um, I also don't want to go go past the point about fate that you brought up because that's something that's incredibly unpopular. No one wants to think that they have a predestined sort of outcome or set of possibilities. But as I get older, I begin to embrace the idea more in the sense that not that everything is predetermined but that there are only a there's a set kind of i i actually like the greek word better this word paradigma because what it means is pattern it's like you can think of your fate that's weaved by the fates as a as kind of a pattern that's sewn right it's like that's you like that you know that's your genetics that's your indescribable you know, psychological capacities and tapestry. It's the mandala of the self. Now, within that, there's all kinds of possibilities. And depending on how you're looking at it or what point of view you're looking at or how much of it you've discovered, it's it's like an open world RPG, right? It's like <laughs> the game is what the game is, but you don't know what the game is until you explore the game and you beat the game and you get to level 100 and you get 100% completion. And I sort of think that we're living in a higher dimensional version of that kind of a reality that due to karma or divinity or circumstance or some mixture of all of the above or like they called it the throne of necessity in Greek myth, like all of these things come together and boop Ido Cohen, you know, and Mm -hmm. and I, I that kind of makes sense to me that we, that we come in to the world with this set of attributes and you know if you're making a character in an rpg it's like you have the stats for a wizard you could try to be a warrior if you want to but you're probably going to be a very <laughs> shitty warrior yeah, you and are. maybe maybe you were born into a family of warriors and they're all trying to get you to be you know it's like i i feel like it's some version of that for most people um, especially for people who feel a strong spiritual calling like an, a, a, a sort of out of placeness that another greek word that i love that word aporia aporia yeah. that that just deep uncertainty of of unfinishedness of unanswerableness and yeah i i just the, the older I get, and I can't explain it other than saying it's an intuitive thing, is that you sort of had in the same way, you know, the acorn and the oak tree thing, in the same way an acorn can become an oak tree to an extent your possibilities are already somewhat determined, but in a very open-ended way. 
if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Why do you think people are resistant to that? Because I, 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 it's especially a certain type of person is very resistant to that. But I think there's something within us that doesn't want to believe that we're limited or that our mm. our agency or our free will is at all compromised. <laughs> um, th- I mean, this is especially true of very like intellectual people or you know very empirical people. But I think it's also it's true of me even to an extent. Like I don't want to believe that <laughs> I have a set anything i want to believe that i can change whatever i want um yeah you reminded me of westworld you know i don't remember the name of the character but that one man who was obsessed with finding the center of the main oh yeah exactly exactly right he's that he obsessed with it and although he's multi-million right he, he cannot let go of the center of the main and he gets to the center of the main and it's a total disappointment yeah right and you, you're making me think, well, if that, okay, if I play with that show, is that whole, all of those characters are, uh, they're all parts mm-hmm. of us, right? We are, mm-hmm. we are a whole, whole constellation of our internal so cyborg this... systems, internal, <laughs> internal Android systems. Well, you know, but Psy- we'll psychology that, joke for that, people that, that don't right, know right. about <laughs> internal family systems. Um, Right, but it, so why do we have that necessity? Like, and it's it's um, it's I because I love I love thinking about tension, right? Because all archetypes, right? Hillman talks about all archetypes are actually they're always pairs. So as much as there is the one that's needing to find the center of the circle, the of the maze, there is the one that's like um, totally objectified, objecting the idea that there is a maze, yeah. that there is a center, that there is right. Yeah, and they're always. Like why? Why are they playing together? Why do we need? And maybe that's our way to try and go back home, whatever home is. I don't know what happens, but right to get to a place of trying to solve the mystery because maybe we remember that there is a solution, or maybe it's because we feel existentially if we knew that there is no center of a maid, what will happen then? But yeah. I, I, I'm very. I like what you're saying, and I, I that movie really made me think about. There, there was a way in the movie it's depicted. It's actually very beautiful, even though the fate there there's not a happy ending. Mm. Not to give them away, away, but the it's, nor- it's the a North very Wind. mixed. Yeah, exactly. But it's a very mixed ending. But it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I haven't so seen it. There's a way I... in which fate is plays into. Maybe it's because it's so irrational. Mm. And that makes us feel helpless. Like, what do you mean I'm gonna be end my life in this place? Where that's like, what? But you don't know what you're gonna go all the way through that, right? That's the movie Arrival. Oh she yeah, sees the future, and she sees it's miserable, but she sees also all these beautiful moments of love. She chooses to follow her fate. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, that that's so, man. Yeah, any of that like non-linear time type shit or gaining some sort of like fourth dimensional POV over reality is it's it's very yeah, that's that's very buzzy and very moving for me. Um well, you know, I I just do harp on that a little bit. Yeah. If you don't mind. You know, cuz what I've been thinking a lot about I had a a personal experience that led me to this explore why Time is maybe circular, not linear, not spirally, but time is a circle. And I landed, I think it ties to this conversation. I landed in, right, the Gita. I think we kind of mentioned that. This, right, this idea that, right, Gita is from the Hindu tradition, mm-hmm. one of the essential books, and it describes this war between, between two families who are actually relatives. Yeah. And there is a point where, right, one of the, the prince, the main prince of the story is about to shoot an arrow. Yeah, Arjuna. Just before he shoots the arrow, right, Arjuna, Krishna, right, like, emerges, God emerges, freezes all time, and teaches him the entire, right, the entire fabric of the universe. And he comes back to that same point of shooting the arrow, and he shoots the arrow. But he shoots it from knowing what's going to happen, right, knowing that a lot of people are going to die. Knowing he's going to lose relatives, knowing he's going to kill his own relative, but he's doing it from a very different place. Right. And I think there is such a profound, as far as fate goes, or it's not even fate, 
how deep do you want to play the game? Yeah. Right. Like you said, this is all open world. I love how you said it. it's all open world, right? Um, RPG. How much? How many side quests are you gonna do? Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it too. Right. How yeah. many side quests are you gonna do? Are you gonna spend time on side quests? Are you gonna talk to every? Uh, what's N the name? NPC. Of? NPC. Thank yeah. you. Every yeah. NPC and collect all the plants you can and go and try to make all the potions at the market, or are you gonna just go for the main, right, the main quest? Yeah. And then you're going to finish the game and be like, okay. Now what? Right. That's it. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of, what do you think of calling people NPCs? Cause that's become a very popular Is you it? Know, meme. Yeah. Yeah. Calling, calling other people NPCs. Yeah. Like there, there's a whole little like sub genre of YouTube video where people will like go into a store and they'll walk around like a like a, a character, and then they'll talk to people like and you know and and do very robotic gestures, and talk to like a, a Walmart employee like they're an NPC or something. I mean, I, I'm not big fan of that. I'm not either. Calling a person an NPC, but I can you know it's it's the, that metaphor was has been here before, right? About people who walking like sleep living or sleep yeah living. yeah matrix or, dwelling yeah. right exactly matrix like they're i'm i i just you know I, that's what I, I know too much about psychology i think at this point to know that that's it's not never that simple no no i don't think so either and you know there's just the the nobody multi... chooses to be an npc or right. i have a patient who beautifully says it nobody chooses to be the secondary character in their own book Right, right. Yeah, that's a whole Usually separate by thing. Circumstance. Yeah, the the flip side. That's the main that main character syndrome. That's another another thing to balance. Because I do think, yeah, like yeah, in terms of your own tapestry, your own paradigm, your own acorn becoming the oak tree, you are the main character. But everybody's Always. the main character in their own story. And yeah, that's that's a that's a weird thing to balance. That that's one of those key dichotomies I think you were just alluding to, how gods always exist in twos. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like I guess it's like a small S self, capital S self thing, but it's also a dealing with that fundamental paradox of like I am immensely important and I'm also no more important than anyone else. Like that right. that whole trying to balance that is is a very difficult thing. Well, right. We were talking about it yesterday about the the almond shape, right? The mandorella, the thing that the Venn diagram, yeah, yeah, of the two circles that's in the middle of every spectrum. Right? Yeah, it's that middle that encapsulates the bow, but it's not. They're not overlapping. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're the main character in your book, but your book has a lot of other characters. Yeah, yeah. The book would suck without those characters. And... Exactly. It would be incredibly boring. It'd just be you, right? It'd mm -hmm. Just be you hanging out. Right. Nobody's gonna read that book. Yeah. Oh, going back to the 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 gods being in in twos thing, the one that I'm the most familiar with actually through Hillman, and this fits into our conversation really centrally too in a way, is that there's the the counterpart to the Hermes archetype is the Hestia archetype. So there's the yeah. Hermes Hestia dichotomy that Hillman talks about, and the idea is that the reason this is important is because we're so enamored with the mercurial Hermes energy in that it's dynamic, it's information, it's language, it's novelty, it's new things flying around, flitting around. Um, you know, he says in one talk that if there were a god of our time, it would be Hermes because it's like capitalism, it's commerce, mm -hmm. it's travel, it's information transfer. Mm -hmm. But what that does then is it blinds us, it puts us in a kind of manic psychic state where we're not resting, we're not home, we're not centered in our bodies, literally, like we're, we're literally not home in a lot of places. We're not taking time to be in the, in the quiet, to be in nature, to be, to turn inward. And we're that's what- Symbolically not home, exactly. Right, or, or, or literally a lot of times. And even if mm -hmm. we are home, we're not home. You know, our mind is somewhere else exactly. projected exactly. Exactly. out into the world. Exactly. Um, and that's what the goddess Hestia is. She's the goddess of the home and the hearth. Mm -hmm. So it's like balancing the goddess of home and hearth 
with that like mercurial ener- energy of novelty and, and information mm-hmm. transfer. Um, and I think that's that, that's the, again, open eye, closed eye. How do you, you know, how do you bridge those two? And there's, a, there's some key emergent um, dialectical transmutation that needs to occur between the two of like always being aware, like, am I burning the candle at both ends too much? Do I need to rest? Am I, am I being too lazy? Do I need more mercury? Um, but it's interesting to think that, uh, was it Hillman you said that said all gods are in twos or did you say it was young? It's called the, by, uh, it's called the bipolar nature of a compound. Ooh, ooh. So, and then there's always, they're always the right. So it's the four in the setting. Oh and, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, and the goddess, right? They're mm-hmm. in the chrome and they're always in two. They have to go there. And he says that every time you meet someone, if you, let's say if I'm a, a Hermes type, everybody else is going to have to occupy something that, and probably the opposite. So eventually I'll evoke the Senex in anyone. But right, if I'm a really an, a Hermes type, I will search other Hermes hmm. because I don't want to be brought back to to Hestia. I don't want to be brought back to Earth. That's a fucking bummer. Yeah, right. So right I'm gonna right. look for that. Right, we talked about it in the context of the the Maps conference. Mm-hmm. Right, what happens when eleven thousand people who are holding a similar energy come and start feeding off each other? Yeah, right. As it's beautiful. It's in. It's you know I pretty sure that, that the goddess of inspiration was so prevalent. Oh, the, the hermetic so energy, many, the hermetic energy, her, like the, the mercurial energy in that place was nuts. It was just nuts because there's just so many people, so many ideas flying. Like, like, exactly. th- like, like pick your Hermes archetype. It was all over the, the, you know, all the over. Hermes, the, the famous Hermes, the orator. I mean, 500 different speakers, right? There's like people doing commerce in their booths. There's people stopping and talking and having philosophical conversations just mm-hmm. nonstop for, for several days. And not to mention psychedelics are a hugely mercurial hermetic Hermes. substance. Oh, I mean, you're, you're going in, you know, you're in the liminal space between. Yeah. So yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you made me think that the, the, right. So the two, it's the, I've I've had part of my post fire experiences. I've come to this place where I had this, multiple experiences, and I've um, a friend of mine offered me a reflection about the god Phanes, P H A N E S, hmm. who I did not know until. I don't know that either. It, what what culture exactly. is that from? So that's Greek. Hmm. So if you know about the the Orphic uh, egg, right, the the cosmic egg wrapped in the serpents. That was the first thing that basically emerged from Kronos. From that egg emerged Than. And Thetis was an androgynous god. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. He was, it's not even that she. They yeah. were, they started creation from being the two in the one. Right? And it's the same like we, even in the in Kabbalah tradition, right? God split himself from unity to no opposite. Because only through opposites you have relationship. And only through relationship you have life. Because in the one, it's not it's not exactly life as we know it. It's something very different. It's non-relational living from a Kabbalistic. Yeah. Right? So you like you merge the more you go into being on planet Earth in a, a true psycho spiritual birth, you are always in that too. Yeah. Right. There is this beautiful bunch of images called the Rosarian Philosophum, which I like show the two slowly, how the two merges into the one. Mm. Right. They started separate two, one is lunar, one is solar, and they slowly walk towards this bath. And inside the bath, they start overlaying into each other. They start merging under this really beautiful white dove, who is a symbol of the and cool. then from that merger, a new being comes into it. Which, if we to go back to Jungian terms, right, that's the transcendent function. That's the process you're always one eye open, one eye close. You're in, you take in, you do the alchemy, something new gets born. You put it in the world. Then the world responds to that. You move on, you move on. Right? But this, this idea of. I don't know, it feels very psychological to me. I was just going to say it. It's like we're. It's anti-relationship. If you and I are not going to argue, if you and I are going to like disagree, if we're not going to like 
friction in each other, right? Have these like mm-hmm. one of my favorite English words is conference. Hmm. The meaning of the word confrontation is coming face to face with the heart of a matter. How beautiful is that? Yeah. You and I are going to come face to face with the heart of something. Who would, I don't know. Why wouldn't you want to do that? I want to do that all the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've been doing it for the last hour and something. We're constantly coming together, looking for hearts of something and then mm-hmm. talking about this heart. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Right. And why are we, and I think that's where I'm, you're, I called you as someone who is very knowledgeable in Hermes. I don't think Hermes is a very relational archetype. And if our culture is her, it's hermetic, Right. It says something about there is a missing link. Maybe that's, I think that's what you brought. That's Hestia. Hestia is related. Be at home. Relate to yourself. Relate to the warmth of your heart, to the fireplace, to the plants inside your house, to your children, to the birds singing on a tree. Right. It's all about healing the relationship. Right, right. Hermes is not a very additional archetype. Right, because it's it's a well that does make sense. Yeah, because it's an always moving. It's it's a it's an archetype of transition. Right. So how are you having a deep relationship in transition? It's it's exactly. a, it's much more of a transactional. Like I I do I have this relationship to get to the next thing would, would be would be the sort of yeah I can see why you would say that yeah right um, isn't it the the English term you use it for people who are like you can't quite grasp them, so you call them their mercurial. Oh, right, right, yeah. Right, you're like you catch them and they whoop, they slip out of your hand and they're in some other dimension. Also. Yeah, right. And they're mercurial. Um, and I think that that's the beauty of how the God essence is mirrored in humans. How all these things are mirrored in humans, right? Relationship. So, if you want to, kind of coming, here is our uh, our Juno Krishna moment, three sixty into shadow. If you want to look like, look at your relationships, not just to your to other people, but look into your relationship with everything. For those who are watching uh, Black Mirror now, then you and if you watch Ooh, the new, yeah, I need to. New... No, I haven't yet, but I definitely oh, will. Wow, I will. Yeah. I will. It's the whole thing, the shadow theme is just screaming loudly through it. I believe it. But the whole thing is through our relationship to first thing is about it's funny, it's Netflix are making fun of themselves. Oh sure. The first episode is about a couple, a woman who sits her life on it. Hmm. And every episode, every night is the day that happened to her. Oh, and wow. it ends up uprooting her entire life because wow, you know, she's forced to. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, and she's forced to confront herself. Yeah, and she keeps trying to get out of it instead of dealing with it. Wow, yeah, it's always there. There is right. It's a very Buddhist idea, right? Trungpa talked about it. We are basically monkeys inside a square house that's all mirrors. Hmm. Until the monkey start realizing that it's just looking at reflections of itself, shadow work, yeah. separateness. Yeah. And only when the monkey comes out, the monkey can actually start experiencing deeper life. Yes. Yes. Have Have you seen Beef, the series Beef on Netflix? You told me to watch it. Okay. Yeah. For anybody then, listening, w- without spoiling, um. It starts out as a super crazy, over the top, like, you know, just road rage incident where these two main characters are just trying to get back at one another in the most preposterous ways. But as the show goes on, it becomes very clear that it's about each character projecting their shadow onto the other main character. And surprise, surprise, one main character is masculine, the other one's feminine, is, is a female. And the director himself, the show creator himself said that the show is about the shadow and dealing with the shadow. Mm -hmm. So I I won't go any further than that because I don't want to spoil anything, but it was such a brilliant show. And when it started to make that more earnest turn toward being very psychological and psycho spiritual, um, I was very 
I was very into it. And I've seen some people be like, it gets weird toward the end. And I'm like, no, it gets good toward the end. That's when it gets good, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is it is really interesting how I, I think that that is a popular, it's always been a popular convention of media, but it seems like it's having a major resurgence now. Like this, mm. uh, the, like the shadow in media and people's need, like some kind of like catharsis for shadow work emerging in the media, I think is really starting to emerge more. And I think it says a lot about the zeitgeist and where we're at in terms of needing to find mechanisms to deal with that and make that practical. Because, man, I mean, it look, again, in my own case, having that shadow video that's doing so well, it's clearly striking a note with people. It's clearly absolutely like striking at something that people are are thirsty to know about or thirsty to understand how to get their hands around. And I don't know if this conversation made it easier or or just made it more like esoteric, yeah. but yeah, or yeah, I don't know. But um, it, right, it's always mirrored, right? We're talking about the orca. I think it's hilarious in some beautiful synchronistic way that for those who have watched the second Avatar, there's yeah. a scene in Avatar, right, in the end where the sea creature jumps and sinks a whole boat. Yeah, right. And it's happening. It's mm -hmm. actually happening. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. So what is the collective unconscious like pushing towards, right? Out of that bottom of the that the depths of the ocean, this energy that's like, hey, you need to pay attention. Right. And it's not surprising to me that it's a female org god that started this whole thing. Hmm. They know, you know that? that you know that. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a female org god that got hit by a boat and survived. And literally recruited her, I don't know, a school of orcas. I don't know if that's how you say it, but, and that's when it first started. And what happened, what they're saying is that orcas then started teaching that to each other. That's so crazy. That's so crazy. Right. But symbolically for me, it's like, yeah, this is nature talking to us about what we're not doing. Right. 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 We went through all these waves of it. Right. Me too. We talked about Trump. COVID, all of these are like spontaneous eruptions that are naturally coming and like, hey, yes. you need to look at the you need to look at the thing you're repressing. You need to look at this side. Right. This is a great example of how these outward events are the open eye of a closed eye process. And yeah. it's not about spiritual bypassing and saying there's like, oh, there's some orchestrated reason for us that this is happening it's like no it's the direct psychic overflow of not paying attention of being irresponsible of spiritual bypassing in a lot of ways yes, because yes. We, we sit here in our flowy clothing and our big hats and we talk about spiritual things and we keep throwing shit in landfills and we keep burning petroleum and we keep eating you know factory farmed meat and, and by the way things i'm all guilty of but we just don't change and we don't change and we don't change Absolutely. and then there's some kind of invisible psychic overflow that incur that occurs and we're like uh oh whales are mad it's like yeah maybe it's more complex than that you know may maybe it's has to do and it's so simple yeah. if you if you embrace right i'm talking estia Mm -hmm. and sit at home for a second, home inside and home in your home and be like, oh, how, what a weird phenomena. All these ocean creatures are angry that we are polluting their home and killing them. Is it that weird? <laughs> right. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> right. It makes a lot That's of sense. Like if you sit with it. The archetype talks to you, the, the, the phenomena, right? That's what we're saying. Like, let the moment talk to you. Yeah. Stop overlaying, right? Stop this neurotic Western mind overlaying of like, we we are going to tell reality what it is. Man, do you, do you have hope that we can really do something about this? Because all the people listening to this podcast right now, times 10 could come home tonight have a deep mindful experience, have a deep, you know, mind altering entheogenic experience and really feel the reality of this and nothing would change. 
like what what it seems to me really needs to change is structural incentive that only a very very few handful of people could really have an impact on you know it's like like how because we're we're not going to give up convenience we're not going to give up you know the u.s isn't going to give up monetary hegemony so that we can clean the oceans up they're, they're not going to like reduce the military budget so that we can you know address all of these things we're dealing with so what it seems like needs to happen is some kind of foundational incentive change where the right people decide no like now now this is the new yardstick for what success is now this is the new so it may, maybe it is about that profound changing of the mind but it has to happen to like the the illuminati essentially you know not and i don't mean that literally maybe i mean maybe it's literal but I'm, i just mean that in the way of like the people at the very top of the pyramid who really run the fortune 500 companies and really run the governments and really run the military industrial complex like i mean even, think, i think yeah. we need to think longer term. Hmm. those people right. yeah. will die it's the question for me it's who's coming next Right. We talked about this before in the context of Rick Dublin, who started MAP. Yeah. And how people forget that he's been on that. Speaking of someone who's following his fate, right? He has been on a mission for 30 some years. Right. For people that don't know, MAPS is a multidiscipline association for psychedelic studies. They're, they're financing most of the biggest um, FDA the biggest. approval processes and studies and and stuff like that in that field. And and Rick Doblin, the founder, has been pounding that drum for probably 30 years. And, you know, just in the face of enormous um, bureaucratic roadblocks and ideological roadblocks. And um, and yeah, I mean, now there's major Government traction, poli but political roadblocks, yeah. you know, the zeitgeist moving from intense prohibition, right? He started when there was intense prohibition. Yeah. Right. We're talking about post sixties, Nixon and all that stuff. And he managed to chip away at Saturn. He yeah. managed to convince Saturn, if you think about it, to be like, Hey, this is real. And then Saturn slowly it's like, you know what? This is real. Just today I saw that there is a caucus now and then the first one for psychedelic, psychedelic studies. That's in a way, that's a huge step. Yes. Huge. So back to your I think it I, I have to own that I am somewhat of a, I don't know if it's delusional optimism or I just nailed some truth that is something I inherited from in, from tribal indigenous cultures, which is, it's how you raise the next generation. Yeah. Right? The, the kids of today that are going to be the next CEO, the next politician, the next, if they will do it, then the change will. Yeah, but we see we're all we we like we don't like to think long term, right? That's where those earth based, nature connected, where spirituality is not even a word; it's just how you live. They have right. We have a lot to learn from them. It's like you raise the actions of your right. We all know the actions that we do today shape three generations. Mm -hmm. right? Native Americans say it's seven generations back, seven generations. So I'm I'm optimistic, but I I'm I also am very aware that yeah, like you said, it's humans. It's so that we don't want to change. Everybody wants to change. It's I think this whole theme of the conversation it's, it's it takes a lot of work to change. Yes. Yeah, and and I do have it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. If you're listening, it's worth it. Yes, it is. It's absolutely worth it, and you absolutely can <laughs> change despite all the turbulence and despite having to move through the darkness. And I, and I think you're right, man. I think, and I agree, I think it's on a long enough time scale. And I, I deeply, deeply suspect that there is a reflective, and this isn't just me, this is like, this is an, a Jungian idea as well, that there's a collective shadow. There are collective processes going on that we're tiny little microscopic exactly. parts of that psychical community 
working it out in ways that we can't even possibly comprehend but our micro does affect the macro in some way. So not only, I mean, and maybe this sounds very ideological, but not only are you doing it for you, I think you're doing it for the collective. When, when you really do pursue what speaks to your soul, when you really do the hard thing that you know is right, when you really go through those transformations and those like initiations and whatever permutation they are for you, I think you are leaking a little bit of ambrosia into the zeitgeist. I think you're leaking a little bit of that transformative elixir yeah. into the collective psyche. And even if that's just a nice story, that's a mythology I want to participate in. You know, that that's something that I want to uh, I'm I'm okay spreading that spreading that meme because I think that that yeah. that that is the psycho spiritual collective transformation that this world needs like we we need that to be real if it's not real we need to fucking make it real <laughs> you know and that's where you yes i totally and just hearing you say that i feel less alone like yeah we're we're, we're in it we're in it together right yes it's so i share this with you i get patients of mine who listen to your podcast and it it changes something like truly i'm not saying this to like you know I'm, I, I always I, I like to say that I'm honest to a default. <laughs> it doesn't always right, work right. for my benefit, right? But we we can impact each other profoundly on an individual level. Yeah, and it's not that we all need to now become you know hyperactivists and try and always create change and try. No, but you, if we all follow the one eye, one close, one open eye, something will happen. Mm -hmm. But let's mm -hmm. be real, most of us. And even those of us who do, it's it's demanding. Yes, it is very. We demanding. can do this. We can do this. There is there is a way in which we can impact each other. And I, I you know, I always I think about it often. I don't know how much of it is me being Israeli. Mm -hmm. You know, I coming from a uh, it's a culture that in its roots is more collectivist. Although now it's it's changed. Um, the idea that the revolution will always come start with individuals. It starts from the spread of collective and it rises up. And we keep looking and there is something very religious to me that I can't quite explain that we keep thinking that the revolution is going to come from the top down. Right, right, right. right? It just speaks directly to, for me, it's like, oh yeah, we constantly keep looking up, thinking like, okay, when will that CEO decide to do that and then things will change? When will that government we know that you're right yeah but if yeah. all the you know i've always asked if everybody everybody in the world like everybody in one city decides that from now on they are all going to compost specifically in one place and then use this to build community garden and they commit to that process for a year How incredible would that be? Because yeah. I'm pretty sure that will create, because it's not just about that, right? It, then people have to, like we said, they have to think about how do we work together? Everybody yeah. going to put, anyway, that's yeah, my, it, you my know, it, maybe it, delusional optimism. Well, that's, that's a cool example, because in some ways that would be like a good example of a Hermes Hestia, Hestia. cooperative mm -hmm. act, because it's like you have the organizational and person and energy transfer project based mindset of the of the mercurial plus mm -hmm. the desire to like nourish the hestia oh right. you know and and that yeah and i think that might be a more macro example of what we were talking about earlier of like of balancing that inner and outer in mm -hmm. yourself yeah and i think if we i think if we looked at bigger projects more in that way and we always ask the core question of like what is this nourish nourishing what what is this home for? Like what 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 would this be mm -hmm. a home for? I think those kinds of big questions could really, you know, dip us in medicine a little bit. You know, <laughs> just the toes. You know, just yeah. enough. It's a, start with the toes and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love you, man. This has been another another I love great you too. another this great mind great. meld. So much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, we'll do it again. Absolutely.